Good evening. Uh, the way that life worked out, it didn't allow for me to uh, record the sermon this last weekend. So uh, here I am on Tuesday evening, uh, here ready to go through what we covered this weekend. Uh, not quite the usual format. I'm not in the uh, sanctuary, but this should work. We're looking at uh, John 5 this evening. And uh, it reads, it's John 5, 19 and following. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in, the, in that like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these that you will marvel. For just as the Father raised the dead and gave them life, even so the Son also gives life to those whom he chooses. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has entrusted all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So that's uh, what we're looking at this evening. <clears throat> I want to start by asking... Um, who do you trust? Trust is always a fun question to ask because if someone ever has to ask for it, like those two words, if anyone, anyone ever has to say, trust me, you know that you probably shouldn't. And so when it comes to trust, trust is something that's offered. And, and you kind of think about it, like who do you trust? Family members, do you trust friends? And, and what do you trust them with? Right. We're going to talk about what how Jesus is trusting and trusted in, in this passage after he's chatting with uh, some Jewish leaders who are telling him that he should not be healing on the Sabbath. And he responds that uh, that he is healing on the Sabbath because he is doing what his father has done and is still doing. And so he can only do what he sees his father doing. And um, so this kind of piles on, I guess, in a sense, and instead of like defusing the situation, which was Jesus is accused of doing work on the Sabbath because they're arguing that healing is work. Um, now he is, in addition, saying that he is doing what the Father does, and, and that is coming off as, well, heretical to the, some of these leaders. Um, and then Jesus makes this argument, sort of lays out this argument. This is one of the longest uh, extended periods of time where Jesus is speaking in all the Gospel of John. And he says, For the Son can only do what he sees the Father doing. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he's doing. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives him life, even so the Son will do the same. For the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. And so this is like really impressively tight argumentation, like setting up because of A, B, C, D, so that all might honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. And, and we could go into what does it look like to honor the Son. We could look at uh, that, that comment about judgment. That's, um, what does the Bible say about how judgment works? That's a whole discussion. We could look at the work on the Sabbath uh, question. Jesus says it, it isn't work to heal someone on the Sabbath. Okay, let's think about that. Um, but where we're actually going to focus this evening is, um, it says the Father trusts the Son with judging. And that word, that trust, that is an amazing amount of trust to entrust to someone else uh, the, to decide the future for the people you love. And so when we start talking about trust, like, do we trust this much? Are we trusting people? Are we trustworthy people? Um, and this is a pertinent question because we are, as a people, called to be people of trust. Uh, this takes a bit of explaining how this, this logic works. We are made in the image of God. That's what we read back in Genesis at the very beginning uh, when God creates humanity, taking dirt and bre breathing the spirit into it, that creates humanity. And, and that we are made in the image of God, which is not to say that God has two arms and two legs, but to say that we are capable of moral decision-making and that we are capable of reflecting who God is. And so as we read through the story of God and God's people in Scripture, we see how this, this happens, that we see that as people know more and more about who God is, it changes how they act. 
It changes who they are. It changes what they do. And so we go from like Noah, who the way he is described is the beginning of Genesis. He is described as a person when uh, God tells him there's going to be this disaster. He builds a boat and he doesn't say anything to try to save his neighbors. He gets in his boat and he floats away, right? That's the best. That was the, the most ethical person that was there. And then by the time we get to Genesis 18, which is not all that much further down the road, we get to Abraham. And when Abraham finds out that the city of Sodom is doomed, he goes to God and argues. If you can find 50, 30, 20, 10, if you, if you can find 10 people who are righteous, can I, can I save the city? Right? And so in that brief period of time, we've gone from Noah, who just like doesn't say anything to try to help his neighbors, to Abraham, who's arguing to try to save neighbors he's never met. Why? Well, it might be that Abraham has been cared for by God, and now Abraham is trying to do the same for others. Right? We can look at the way that the commandments change. The ninth and 10th commandment uh, in the Exodus, the first time that they hear the Ten Commandments, the 10th the commandment is, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's uh, wife or livestock, putting women and livestock, cattle, on the same level of value. And um, 40 years later, as they're going into the Promised Land, they, they question, they, 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 get, they write down the Ten Commandments again, and, it's like, and they realize, like, we might have heard that wrong the first time. We, we might have understood that poorly, such that we need to see that the, it's the Ninth Commandment in Deuteronomy, is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And then the Tenth Commandment goes into livestock, and so women are sort of promoted. Why is that? Well, they've seen Moses lead them in worship. They notice that Moses' sister, Miriam, she can help lead worship too. And maybe they're willing to see things a bit differently because of they've seen something they know more about God. And then we get into like in the New Testament, we have Paul who starts out by saying like women should be quiet in church. By the end of the last chapter of the last book he wrote in Romans, he's saying that Junia is one of the greatest of the apostles. This lady is so amazing. And so why does why does Paul change? He changes because he knows more about Jesus in the way that Jesus invites people, invites women to be part of supporting his ministry. And we can go across multiple examples, but the theme is the same, that the more the people in Scripture learned about who God is, the more it changed how they act. Because they, as we are, called to live in the image of God. We have a goal to be ever more Christ-like. And the more we learn about Jesus, the more that we will we have something to strive for, to be helped by the grace of God to become more like. So we get to this passage in John 5, and it tells us about the inner life of God, of uh, God as Father and Son. And, and this is John 5. We haven't got to John 14 yet. Um, and so we, um, John 14 is where we start getting into the Holy Spirit. And so we're still just kind of focusing on Father and Son. But we can see that the, the Father and Son are have a relationship of complete trust. The Father trusts the Son with all judgment. And uh, that's an amazing amount of trust. And so looking at this, we can say as we're called to, be, to grow into the image of God, we are called to embody this, to be trusting, to be trustworthy, to be a community of trust. And the thing about trust is it is always specific. Like we could talk about trust all day long, but if I asked you to borrow your truck for a week, that's like specific. That's real trust. Will you loan me your truck? That's like, you, we got to figure out, do you trust Andy? Um, and what we have to base that trust on is prior data. Like, if I don't know someone, I don't know if I can trust them or not, because I don't have a pattern to base any assessment on. And the funny thing about trust is like, if I have prior experience to be able to have an opinion, an evaluation of some, some whether someone's going to follow through or not, like that can be a positive trust or it can be a negative trust. I can trust that someone's going to follow through or there are people that I can trust that they will be late because they're always late because that's just that's how they roll, right? And so to think about this, this trust, 
I want you to imagine if you could reduce every decision down to a decision that went, you made the right decision or you made the wrong decision. And every time you make a decision, you're establishing a pattern. So if you make the right decision, uh, and it, it wouldn't be nice if the world was simple as right or wrong decision every time, but just for the sake of argument, right? If ever, when you make a right decision and, and you move up, I guess you'd say, that changes the set of options that are possible for you next time. Because if you go up, you're making the next decision from here. Whereas if you go down, you're making the next decision from, from here. And that changes what your options are. So that if you're making decisions in a, in a, in a certain direction, you're likely to continue them. That's that we know that, right? Someone who has decided to put other things uh, ahead of being on time is very likely to continue to do that. Someone who has decided to show up on time is likely to continue to choose to show up on time. We, we set these patterns. Um, and so what the challenge becomes is how do we give people the opportunity to choose differently than we expect? Like people who've always chosen positively and they show up on time or insert good decision making of your choice there. Showing up on time is kind of a neutral one to discuss. There's lots of other examples I'm sure you can think of. Paying your bills, being kind to your children, etc. Um, but <clears throat> it's easy if someone's making right decisions to say, ah, I trust them to make right decisions. The challenge is, is if someone's making has made a wrong decision or a series a series of wrong decisions, how do we trust them and give them space to try to turn and make the next one be a good decision, um, knowing that it's possible? No, I mean we'll look at the thief on the cross next to Jesus. He had made a series of decisions that had led to him being crucified, and at the last second, he made a very good decision. He looks at Jesus, they chat, and at the end of the discussion. Uh, Jesus says to him, you will be with me in paradise. And so it is always possible for people to make a decision that surprises us. And I would further put out that Jesus kept Judas with him until the end. And, and like Judas, it was not just that he betrayed him in the end. Judas was stealing from the money purse of the group of people. Like, so he was making a bad decision, bad decision, bad decision, bad decision. Um, and yet Jesus didn't look at him and run him off. And so like that, that gives me hope. Like people can change and we can wait patiently and try to help people change. And it's not up to me to choose who to run off or not. Jesus didn't run off Judas. I think I can deal with about anyone else. I mean, there's there are obvious limitations to that. In abuse situations, that's a whole different discussion. But um, we are seeking to be the people who both trust people uh, and give them the space to make decisions. Because, like, part of trusting people is letting them make a real decision. And if I, if I put my thumb on them, like, you're going to decide this, they're not actually deciding it. They're just doing what I'm forcing them to do. But to give people real decisions support them and stay in relationship with people even when they don't choose wisely even when they don't show up in time you still continue to invite them because you want to encourage them to do better this time all right knowing that in the end we're going to end up in the kingdom of god part of the divine family where there is full trust and, and that trust will be fulfilled and, and i look forward to that day and my hope and my prayer is that we can build that trust amongst ourselves as the church between now and then. Amen.